A quick note before we begin today. This episode is with Vibhu from Drip House, and we discuss a little bit his project Solana Spaces, but we don't actually define what Solana Spaces was. So for those of you who weren't aware, Solana Spaces was a retail-focused Solana and Web3 experience that lasted about a year. There were stores in New York and Miami, and some of the core ideas that Vibhu and the team explored within that retail-focused project ended up becoming the company Drip House, which is what we're mostly talking about today on the episode. Bibu, welcome to Validated. Thanks for having me, Austin. Uh, this is a long time coming. Um, we talked about you coming on a while ago, and I think there was just so much happening with Drip House that we never got around to it. Mm-hmm. And I don't live in New York City. You also don't live in New York City, which is true. Um, but you have a pretty incredible journey into where Drip House is today. I, I think one of the things that's really fascinating about your experience as a founder is you've been through a lot. Um, a lot great, a lot outside of your control, one of those things being COVID, one of those things being the bull market, turning into the bear market, turning into the crash at FTX, turning into an incredibly true bear market. But now, I mean, Drip House is just an incredible force in the Solana ecosystem. It really has changed people's perception of what an NFT should be and can be, their relationship to artists. Um, you guys have launched a ton of new products and features really quickly, including droplets. Um, so I want to get into to all of that, but let's kind of just start out with, give me an overview of what Drip actually is. Sure. The Drip's a really simple product. Uh, works very much like the products you're used to in Web2, where you have content creators. Uh, in our case, it's artists, it's musicians, it's people that make videos, uh, and they distribute content to their fans every single week uh, through Drip. The twist is that all the content that they send out is actually on-chain. And so that gives it all these interesting superpowers like scarcity, like trading. Uh, and yeah, it's been um, one of the fastest growing apps in all of crypto, I believe, um, certainly in Solana. And uh, and I'm really excited to uh, continue to, to, to grow it. Yeah. So I want to kind of dig in on that initial idea for Drip because, you know, it's hard to kind of rewind our brains. But if we go back to that time, uh, 10,000, 15,000 PFP collections were all of the rage. And so much of the attention and focus was on uh, how does that market cap get bigger? What do projects and collectors and creators have to do to sort of push that market cap up? Royalties were uh, crashing to go to functionally non-existent. This is right after Yaw had launched. Magic Eden went to zero. Tensor went to zero, everyone went to 0% royalties, and uh, PNFTs as a standard really hadn't caught on yet much at all. And there was kind of a bit of a crisis, I think, within the NFT creator community, very similar to the crisis that I think a lot of traditional musicians went through when LimeWire and Kazaa and BitTorrent were first coming on the scene. So in that sort of chaotic storm, what did you see with Drip where you're like, oh, there's room to do something different here? Yeah, so Drip started as a side project of Solana Spaces, and initially it was this like sim simple uh, list for NFTs, basically. Yeah. Um, kind of similar to like a Mailchimp uh, email list, and every week we were sending a single piece of art or maybe a couple pieces of art to everyone that was on the list. And uh, I remember thinking this was started around October last year, um, right before. Uh, they who shall not be named um, went under and, October of twenty two. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, yeah, we we sent out this like big edition, uh, photography edition, uh, to our people in this that had come to the store and people that engaged on Twitter. And I I remember thinking, oh, that wasn't that expensive. Like, why aren't people uh, like? sending more, like, airdropping more NFTs, hmm. you know? Like, why aren't people utilizing Solana for its kind of, uh, you know, favorable cost structure to to do things at a, at a bigger scale than you would typically see? And uh, we kept, kind of, like, kind of rolling this ball down the hill, doing this every single week, picking up users, and eventually we got to, like, you know, 100,000 people on the list, and we were still doing it. And what I really uh, liked about it was that uh, it had this like interesting property of, uh, you know, a group of people who just really, really loved it. 
and that group of people who really didn't like it. Huh. And I was like, that's the perfect place to be. <laughs> Polarization you know? is in. And yeah, and and um, and so yeah, we we knew compressed NFTs were coming, which uh, were an absolute you know unlock for us. I mean, it makes what we're doing possible. Um, and that's when we really grew the product in a whole bunch of ways uh, when that came to mainnet this uh, last year. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about that process of going from saying this is a side project with Solana Spaces. Um, that project is ending. We'll get into how Solana Spaces as well. I want to talk a bunch about pivots. Um, but to actually say, like, we have this thing that isn't our core product that's caught on some amount of attention. Um, I think there's a lot of founders that find themselves in a similar situation. How did you and, and the team go about saying, we have to re-architect most of our core business here, and there's something that's got some fire, a little thread of promise. Like, What is the process of actually exploring that like and, and building a new product just focused on that one feature? Yeah, so I'll take you back to January last year. Um, we did this drop with uh, an artist called Flag Monkeys, and um, and that was when kind of we caught lightning in a bottle for the first time. And we've done that now like a hundred times, you know, over the last year. But that was the first first moment where I realized people really, really like this. And my entire life for like weeks on end was distributing invite codes for Drip. And, yeah. Like I was all all I was doing was like going through DMs on Twitter, <laughs> responding to people. We even like designed merch that ha that said like, um, don't ask me for an invite code. Um, and yeah, I think we were just like, okay, we're spending way too much time on this for it to be a side project. And there's way too much interest, um, in what's going on. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I honestly, it wasn't an obvious thing to do. I think we, um, there were kind of two distinct things happening. One was like Solana Spaces was clearly, um, probably not going to continue. Hmm. And then we had this lightning in a bottle situation but like no business model or like no obvious kind of way to take it forward. Um, but we just, you know, me and a couple of our, uh, of my team, we just felt like there was something there worth pulling on. I remember writing about that on, on socials when we closed down, um, Solana spaces, yeah. just saying like, I think there's something here. I don't know what it is, but I think we should give ourselves another few months just to, to see what else there might be. And uh, I'm very thankful we did that. Yeah. So the the core technology that Drip is built on is really compressed NFTs. How how much of a change was that for you to say like we were doing this with traditional NFTs on Solana before like what did compression unlock for you guys? Yeah. <laughs> well, um so basically Solana Spaces shut down. We decided we're going to continue with this promise of sending one NFT a week which Seems harmless, but then there's 100,000, 150,000 people on the list, and uh, and it's getting quite expensive. And so we we between like end of February and March, um, when compression rolled out, every single drop we were doing was costing us between like eight and twelve thousand dollars. Wow! And that was a lot for us. That we were basically funding that out of pocket at that point. Yeah. Uh, and. Honestly, the moment that Phantom Wallet supported CMTs, the same moment we switched over uh, because, yeah, we really couldn't do another drop, drop on the old spec. It was going to, you know, drain all of our funds. Um, so I think we went from, like, I want to say, like, 11500 for the last drop we did with real NFTs to, uh, like, $50 to... <laughs> The next the next week so it was like yeah i mean it was truly relief for us uh, more than anything else um but then it was also okay that was only 50 dollars uh we can you know we can afford to go 100x from here and not sweat right and 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 that was i mean really our our playbook was trying to figure out okay how can we get more <laughs> more content to people through this format um since the cost allows it and um, that's when we started dreaming up, like, maybe other people might want their own lists um, as well. Yeah. You know, it's it's funny because one of the things I think Anatolia said for a while, and this is something that I've sort of always, that first attracted me to the Solana network, is that step function changes in performance or cost fundamentally change the type of products you can build. 
And it will often take folks a year or two to actually figure out how to use that additional capacity. Um, if you, I mean, the, the classic example of this is we had E-Trade 15 years before we had Robinhood. And that the the user interface paradigm and all these other changes sort of follow the technology. But like, you guys are running very quickly with this. You immediately adopted compression. You immediately sort of started pushing this out and scaling what your house could do. What sort of tech stack were you guys running to actually make that possible? Because you were running ahead of what most service providers and other vendors were. And this was, of course, coming out of Solana Spaces, which was a lot of things, but it was not a tech forward organization necessarily. Yeah, we, we um, I mean, we built most of the infrastructure in house, but obviously, like with um, Solana, it's very important to have composability in a bunch of places. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for us, that meant like, ensuring that wallets could um, see these and, and for some time only Phantom supported it and then I think uh, other wallets kind of came came behind that. Uh, we also ran for three months without any trading because um, no yep. marketplace had solved that yet. And then Tensor, I think in June, released trading for that. So I don't know, for us, like we just, we did, really didn't have a choice. We just needed to um, to, to switch to move costs and we, we no longer cared about whether like everything was fully featured. <laughs> um, but yeah, the tech the tech was um, not so simple. I mean, I, yeah. I think, uh, and, and it continues to be difficult if you want to do it on your own. But nowadays, if you're like starting from scratch, there's I don't know a dozen tools that let you do what we do. Right. Yeah. So let's let's pivot a little bit and walk through some of the economics and mechanics of the creator side of Drip. Um, every time there's sort of a new distribution and technology platform. There's a risk for any artist that's looking to adopt it. I think there's a lot of folks who felt that Netflix was purely a value add in the early days because they were paying more money. And as we've seen, you know, with the writer's strike last year, uh, there's downside effects to changing your fundamental business model. And artists are often very cautious about those changes. So walk me through what those early conversations were like with creators and artists on Solana where you went from saying, hey, look, you're used to selling NFTs for a fixed price and that's usually somewhere between one to five soul. We want to give them away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the first conversations didn't go that well because <laughs> uh, that wasn't a very compelling value prop. Yeah. Uh, hey, go, for, go from making, you know, thousands of dollars every time you, you make something to making nothing. Uh, but yeah, we were very lucky to have a couple of creators like Dijon Poet, who's been uh, a meta creator, meta destroyer on Solana one of one art yep. for a while, um, and a few others that I think uh, valued the audience building above monetization. Uh, and that was kind of what we came at it with is like, hey, this, you know, I think there's a chance that you'll, you'll be able to make money with this in the future, but. Um, in the very beginning, it was just, uh, would you be interested in pioneering something different and yeah. breaking the mold? And, um, you know, for many months, we didn't have much monetization at all. It was just basically donations in the app. Right. And, but yeah, we, in the back of my head, we were thinking the whole time, okay, like we want to make it very accessible for users to give back to creators that they like. Um, but we also need to like expand on the kinds of business models that exist in crypto and probably bring some of the Web2 stuff in, in as well. Because the reality is that if you took all of the money that users and people in the world have to spend on content, um, it's probably less than um, the the total capital that advertisers are like willing to spend to reach those audiences. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah, basically... Uh, we've been kind of straddling both of these universes. One of like giving users tools to give back to creators, starting very accessibly. Um, we're also starting to build some kind of more audience-based models. Like we just rolled out sponsor collectibles this week. Right. And, um, and you know, I think where does like all the, where, where does all the money come from in the future? I think it's going to be um, coming from this like inefficiency that exists in, in Web2 around content where uh, creators really don't get paid. Um, platform has exercised tremendous leverage over them. Uh, and we have uh, only abstracted business models in Web2. We don't have any model that's focused directly on content monetization itself. Yeah. I mean, so YouTube was the original 
platform that did 50-50 ad share. It started on X now. Um, Instagram still has functionally no ad share model. And so with a lot of these places, like if you look at the economics of creators, the ones who are really successful are, it tends to be making most of their money actually off platform or a significant portion through brand deals and, you know, influencer endorsements or in-person events and those sort of things. What do you find the revenue streams are for that sort of top 20% of drip creators? Are they actually getting a significant amount of revenue through droplets now? Or is it actually like when they do a collection drop through you, they're one of one sales on exchange art and places like that actually see an increase in value? Um, I mean, it's been both. Um, you know, there's, and part of it is just that, um, the collector audience that we built is much bigger than, um, than all of the rest of kind of Solana NFT formats combined. Yeah. Um, like the, one of the like fascinating things about NFTs is that there are more creators than there are collectors. Um, not only in hmm. Solana, but on, on other blockchains as well. Really? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, it's really a struggle for for many. I mean, we'd like to think about, you know, the top creators who like will mint to work for whatever they want and sell it yeah. and, and have no problem doing that. But for um, 80 to 90 percent of creators who are doing PFP products or selling art, um, actually, the, the struggle is real hmm. <laughs> and it's very difficult to find a single person to buy. Um, so we've expanded that audience to a much bigger size than the creator yeah. pool. I mean, there's 3,000 collectors for every creator on Drip right now. <laughs> and so uh, on Drip, they're making tons of money through droplets. Um, since we launched in December, we've already paid out $150,000 in the just in the last 45 days, basically, to a, a group of like 80 creators, um, which is just not insignificant. But also, yeah, they're setting new all-time highs all the time on their other stuff because they're picking up new audience members who find out about them through Drip and then go explore what else they've been making. And I think it's been um, very positive for the entirety of of the Solana creator community. Yeah. L let's hang on droplets for, for a second. Um, walk me through how those work, where that actually $145,000 that you guys have paid out is actually coming from and, and sort of how these creators mm -hmm. are turning that into, you know, good old fashioned U.S. dollars if that's what they want. Yeah. Um, sure. So droplets are a, uh, it's not a token. It's a, uh, in-game currency, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, we think of it like an arcade credit, right? You go to the arcade, you load up your card and, yep. and you go spend it. Um, and, uh, what we designed is this like two tier system. So you have, um, users can collect droplets for free, um, every six hours. And if they're, um, paying attention and kind of active, um, they're collecting, you know, I don't know, 20 to 30 cents per day um, uh, worth of droplets, mm -hmm. which is not insignificant uh, for many people in the world. And then you can also buy them in bulk. And so our, you know, uh, there's a certain class of users, maybe 10, 15 percent of them that are buying, you know, 100 uh, for a dollar or, or 100,000 for for a thousand dollars, if you will. And droplets are the thing that unlocks experiences within Drip. So Yep. One is uh, each time that you, so you subscribe for free to creators, but each time you receive any collectible from them, it spends a droplet from your balance. So you always mm -hmm. have to have droplets to receive them. Uh, but you can also donate and um, put yourself on a leaderboard for a creator. And uh, all of our creators have outlined perks that you get for donating. So if you like, donate 100, hey, I'll get you, you'll get like this special edition of this. Or if you donate 1,000, you'll get access to my Discord and you'll get a, right. a legendary. So they've... Really, there's like a full uh, marketplace happening now around around this, and uh, we every 24 hours we redeem those droplets for USDC um, automatically with Solana. Yep. And this is a a big unlock because most of the creator economy tooling around creators has a lot of artificial barriers that are built around right um, payment rails in Web two. Yeah, and I mean Patreon is what like a 10 percent take rate. Um, it's more, it's like, uh, depends on your class of creator. So there's mm. like, if you're just starting out, I think it's 8%. And then if you're a pro, it's like 12%. Wow. Um, but that doesn't include the fees, the cash right. out, all that kind of stuff. Right. And, um, and they're kind of forced to, I don't blame them. I, I mean, creators get really upset about it, but the reality is that if you 
swipe your credit card for a dollar subscription on a creator. Uh, Patreon is going out and paying, you know, a minimum fee, maybe 20, 30 cents to their card provider and, um, you know, two to three and a half percent of that transaction. So it makes it difficult to, for them to pay out creators um, that are like kind of below a certain floor. Uh, and, um, and, you know, I think the problem that that <laughs> creates is that, uh, and the, the reality that, that very few want to talk about is that there's so much content on the internet. Most of it is not worth a dollar a month. And, um, yeah, to an individual person, yeah. I can't, I can't afford to pay 10 creators for 10 pieces of content every month when I'm consuming thousands of pieces of content every month. Right. Pay them ten dollars a month. That doesn't make any sense. So, drip is. I think the real secret to what we're building is is actually on that side. It's actually the it's actually the payments. That's the most important thing. Interesting. As we allow these like tiny tiny increments of subscriptions, one cent a month, half a cent a month, to subscribe to a content creator, and now now all of a sudden anyone can subscribe to a hundred or five hundred, um, and receive all the content that they would want. And they can do it for, for a very affordable price. And that's, um, and we can pay creators at the tiniest increments too with Solana. So that's a huge, huge um, aspect of what we're doing. Yeah, I, I kind of love that that model because, I mean, people have tried this in broader senses before, right? In, in some ways, BAT, the basic attention token in Brave is sort of an attempt to do something like this. And access protocol, which is still early and doing something a little different is trying to do this for for written content on sort of more traditional sites. But, um, you know, I, I don't even think about, I watch a lot of YouTube, mm -hmm. um, love YouTube, like educational YouTube is tell. like, yeah, yeah it's, uh, educational YouTube is like a happy place for me. It's like if I'm a little bit too tired to read a book, but still want something to be like curious about, like, man, get yeah. me some material sciences engineering videos. How many creators do you subscribe to on YouTube? I subscribe to probably 20 channels and yeah. I pay you for YouTube premium. Sure. Um, but even in that model, you know, it's like my, my $7 a month or whatever it is for YouTube premium it's not going that far for all of these creators, let alone all the other random stuff that I end up watching. Yeah, well, I mean, it's just an indirect model, right? You're actually yeah. not paying for the content that you're exactly. consuming at all. Um, you're feeding it into their enti the entirety of their system, and there's all kinds of, you know, um, floors for monetization. Like, some of them may, may not yeah. even be monetized at all. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to fit, hit a certain bar for that. I mean, this is exactly um, where I think you know, making payments accessible really helps because you're not going, the reality is, I mean, maybe you will, um, but many people will not even be able to pay a dollar per month per subscription on YouTube. And this, you know, the subscription model, I think one of the reasons why it's such a powerful model for businesses is because it's a subsidization model. Like if yeah. you're watching a creator's, you're, you're subscribing to New York Times for $5 a month mm -hmm. and you read two articles a month, and your your you know um, your mom is reading the New York Times every day all day, and that's her like primary consumption vehicle. You're both paying five dollars a month. One of you is being very extractive, and one of you is not. Yeah. And the theory is like, oh, well, let's just like balance all of this. Um, all this balances itself out. Right. But it doesn't. It doesn't. No. It becomes. Um, it's very. It's a very unfair um, model, and it actually like. Because of that, it also makes it inaccessible because they, they have to set a certain price bar. Yeah, it's know? that classic thing of like, why is why is a cable TV bill, especially in like the mid 2000s, why is it $130 in the United States? And it's like, well, actually 35 of that is just ESPN. Whether you want it or not, that's how much it costs yeah. every cable subscriber. And sort of in a world of unbundling and sort of breaking apart subscriptions and services, people are really starting to see that cost. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I think Drip is m much more of an old-fashioned kind of approach to it, which is, like, you pay for the things that you are using. And it, it's not um, – I mean, it really is, like, a very obvious thing to do. Yeah. We just got trained not to do that. We got trained that you're going to hit a paywall when you go try to find something on the internet or you're going to have to pay 
you know, 10 bucks a month after your 30 day trial expires to access content. Yeah. Um, and I don't, you know, I mean, I don't know. Netflix is making thousands of shows a year and I'm watching one of them and yet I'm paying the same as someone who watches a hundred of them. We just, we just take it for granted now that that's how these things should work. And maybe yeah. it doesn't have to work that way. That's, that's what I wonder. Yeah, I mean, I kind of love that as like a, a a vision and model too, and also the idea that you're not actually directly subscribing to Drip, right? If you are a user of the platform who comes there and and finds new, you know, content, you're claiming droplets, and that's awesome. But also, it's not like there's an auto pay, right? Like you have to actually opt to top up your balance. You have to opt to claim your drops. Um, that's a really interesting model. Too, which feels like it would have been very easy to say, look, the way the platform works is when you sign up, you deposit one soul and we just micro bill you from that. Um, but you guys have chosen to build it in a much more accessible way. Well, we, I mean, people need to fall in love with the product and many crypto products, I think, um, have too high of a barrier to entry. And, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're starting out with one soul as you're at this current price, <laughs> as your like minimum threshold to participate, you just excluded like 95% of the world as people. And and crypto to me, like what I saw in it was th that it could be an accessible financial system. And yeah. yet we somehow have, have like in many places done exactly the opposite. Like we've we've like made it even more difficult to use and more restrictive than traditional financial rails. So, um, I you know, I mean, Drip, you know, started it free. We'll always start it free. Uh, I would definitely, definitely... Um, say to every founder out there, like, how can you make what you're doing a um, hundred times, you know, more economical for people? And how can you start it free? I think that's a, and that's something that Solana specifically um, allows you to do, I think. Yeah. So I want to go back to last year when you guys raised around. Um, this was not a time when it was easy to fundraise. Uh, this is not a product that at the time had a monetization stream attached to it. Um, what were what were the conversations like? Because most crypto VCs were were not looking for projects like Drip at the time, and most traditional VCs were too scared to invest in anything that had blockchain involved in it. So, mm -hmm. what what was that vision that convinced a bunch of folks to say, "Yeah, there, there's something here, even if we don't know what the end result is yet." Yeah, I mean, it was uh, really the conviction of. Um, Chris Berniski, ultimately, uh, placeholder. He, yeah, I mean, it wasn't just like people weren't investing in blockchain, like people weren't investing in Solana stuff at all. Yeah. <laughs> you won last year. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't blame them, but, it, you know, yeah. it was like, it took a lot of vision to to dig in at that time with the startups in, in, in the scene. And, um, yeah, I think he's, I think he saw what we saw, which was, which was like, there's something interesting here. Um, you know, again, that the fact that it makes people uncomfortable, but it continues to grow is kind of a very good thing. And obviously we had a very good team. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. He, uh, yeah, when he when he agreed to do it, then uh, everyone else wanted to do it. So from there it was easy. But uh, yeah, he, he, he took, uh, he has some big cojones for sure. Yeah, I, I will say also Chris Berniski, one of the nicest and most helpful investors you will ever meet. He's... <laughs> Yeah, he's different. He's different. Yeah. He's so calm. He's got surfer vibes at all times. I don't you call him with any problem. And uh and he's he's a lot of crypto VCs are more um uh like trader types. Yeah. He is actually has a trading background. He's quite a good one, I think. Um, but he's also very patient and um yeah, we really like to work with him. Please send him this clip. <laughs> <laughs> so before Drip, there was Spaces. And before Spaces, there was Beta. And I actually, I think I met you back in 2015 when a startup I was working for actually had a product that they were placing in the San, one of the Palo Alto Beta stores. Mm -hmm. um, but so, so talk to me a little bit about the process of pivoting from, a, from an organization that was like high-end, high-touch retail to something that was crypto focused, to something that now is almost the opposite of, of all that. You've left the physical world entirely. It's not working with products, it's working with content. Um, what, what was that process like as a founder of going through all those ups and downs and, and you know, finding something now that really seems to have really stuck? Yeah, I mean, I, my 
life's pursuit is to build things that, um, and especially to build things that challenge the structures and business models that we have out there yeah. today. I mean, beta was um, really nothing more than an idea to kind of rearrange the economics of retail. And then, you know, I mean, it wasn't a simple idea, but but bringing that to life, um, you know, was a process of convincing people that the old system was wrong and they should try something different. And for some reason, um, uh, I've always, uh, yeah, I've definitely like, uh, always had a contrarian view on these kinds of things. So I think from that perspective, uh, many of the things I've worked on have a similar outlook. And if you think about Drip, it's very much, hey, maybe the maybe the business model that you've been um, pitched on NFTs is wrong and there's something else that could be built. Um, and yeah, the opportunity with Solana Spaces was um, not so dissimilar. I mean, I think I'd spent many years building these kind of high-tech, high-touch stores uh, and it seemed to me like crypto was widely misunderstood. Even during the the bull market, it was, um, I mean, there was a lot of uh, euphoria, but uh, but for many people, it still felt, and for me, I mean, I, honestly, I, I couldn't understand what was going on in the space, but I wanted to learn. Hmm. And the challenge of like building a retail experience that um, was accessible and uh, was designed for someone who had no idea what was going on. Uh, seemed very interesting, and Drip is still a manifestation of that because, yeah, I mean, the things we learned building Solana Spaces about onboarding people into our space uh, are very are, were invaluable. Like yeah. we we've been pitching crypto in entirely the wrong way to everybody, and that's why our space is you know dominated by traders and not not retail users yet and. Hmm. Drip is going to fix that. What do you think is the right way to pitch crypto? Yeah. So I've been thinking about it as the new internet. It's the internet where um, things work differently than what you're used to, but um, but you as a user have more control. Um, and, um, you know, in theory, your experience is, um, is more favorable in different ways. I mean, I think uh, the very, like, just, you know, Imagine pitching someone on, here's Amazon, here's decentralized Amazon. And in this version, and imagine all the things were equal, but in this version, you are you own a piece of the company and yeah. um, and you're benefiting from the, from, the, from the economics of that business. And when you don't, like people will prefer the one where they have ownership and have a say and where they're benefiting economically. And so, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, the new internet is really the, the way for me. And it and it's art and it's art and content because everyone understands that um, that mental model. Like yeah. it, it's uh, and the fact that it's digital is uncomfortable at first, but mm. um, it doesn't take so long to um, to appreciate uh, what it means to own something on chain like that. Yeah, it's sort of like to go back to the YouTube analogy. It's like there were, there was a few years when people making films for YouTube were laughed at by Hollywood. And then those people started getting invited to Hollywood to make films. Mm -hmm. It yeah. feels like we're kind of in that same gap right now. Yeah, and and people are used to paying for digital goods, right? I mean, we do have, you know, I mean, we, you and I grew up buying software in boxes. And, um, and I, I know there's a lot of like... We are old, aren't we? Yeah, definitely. But... Um, but even today, like, I mean, there's been a, a big controversy around, uh, like, the big game companies yeah. switching from a ownership model to a licensing model. Um, and the reason why is that uh, it's not fair. <laughs> like, people actually do want to own the things that they pay for. Yeah. And and that's digital stuff. That's software. And I, so I think, to me, if, like, if someone can believe that you own a piece of software on your computer that you bought for and you paid for, um, the leap from there to like other things that are digital that can be owned is not um, not so great. Uh, but the way we present blockchains today is like decentralized, like defi, like uh, you know, it's very much um, uh, like yeah. fight the system. It assumes everyone has already bought in on the vision of blockchain while you're pitching them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and 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 you you like somehow like no matter what you always end up. You know, going back to Satoshi 
and like the banking crisis in 2008, right? Yeah. To explain everything. And like, the, honestly, nobody cares. Yeah. I mean, some people do, but not, not that many. Um, like m what most people want is like just better experiences and, um, and drip, I, I really think drip is that, like, I think drip is a better content consumption experience. I think it takes people back. I get comments all the time. This feels like Tumblr or this feels like the yeah. early days of, of these like internet, um, like content pr protocols before it got messy with, you know, ads and, and election, uh, you know, controversy, all that kind of stuff. Right. <laughs> uh, it takes you back to a simpler time and. Um, and I, I don't take it as, uh, a given that the things that came before today, um, are going to be here forever. I yeah. think we can build better things. Love it. Um, do you have any advice you would give founders who maybe thought they were building backend technology companies and are now finding themselves in building much more user facing products and services? Um, like in Solana? Yeah. So, yeah, I kind of mentioned a few things. I think starting it free is very, very important. Um, but I think what crypto specifically allows you to do is not only to give, to start it free, but to actually um, give people, uh, you know, like real financial incentives from very early days. Now, it's a, uh, you know... Um, it's it can be a deal with the devil because you give people things for free and then you have farming and you have um you know airdrop hunters and you have sybil problems and all these kind of things um but it really is a catalyst for for growing fast and um and so like i you know drip drip is not a non-financial product i mean it really it is a financial product yeah. <laughs> like very deeply so um but we we um you know we felt comfortable um, subsidizing the uses of the product for a long time. And I think, uh, you know, if you're struggling for growth today, um, put on your lens about what people really want. And then what people really want is to be, uh, is to have fun, but also to be rewarded. And there's many, many things that are in the Web2 space that I think can be um, reinvented with these kind of better incentives. Um, there's just, yeah, there's tons and tons to be built right now. I mean, like it, literally everything in Web2 can be disrupted, I believe. Yeah. Love it. Well, for artists listening, how can they get involved in Drip? For aspiring collectors, how can they start collecting? The best thing to do is to follow at Drip underscore house on, on Twitter. Um, I refuse to call it X. <laughs> it's Twitter to me. Uh, you go to our link in, the, in, in our bio, and there you'll find an application form to join. You'll also find an invite code to join Drip for free as a, as a, as a collector. Um, yeah, if you ever have any problems, you can DM the account and we'll take care of you. Excellent. Well, Bibu, thank you for coming on Validated. Thank you, Austin. Awesome.